Now, if you have your Bibles, please take them and turn with me to Psalm 86. As we continue our study in the songs of our faith, we're looking at Psalm 86. And each time we look at one of the songs, I share three major observations about that song that makes it so important and significant as part of the inclusion or the collection of the songs that are in the book of Psalms. Now, the three observations start with this one, and this is kind of interesting. This is a song of David, and you might say, well, there are lots of songs of David. Why does that set this one apart? Well, as we were working through earlier songs, when we were looking at Psalm 72, the last verse of Psalm 72, verse 20 says, this ends the prayers or the songs of David. And you think, oh, well, then we're not going to hear any more from David, right? No, there are actually 18 more songs. And so it's as if they finished. And you remember that the book of Psalms is actually five separate books or collections of songs. And so when it ended with Psalm 72, it's as if, okay, we're done with the songs of David. But as they were putting the last two collections or books together. They said, oh, here are some more songs that we've found and we're going to include them. And so the 18 songs include 86, 105, 101, 103, and all of the rest of the numbers that you see. Those are all the remaining songs of David. But what makes Psalm 86 so completely unique from all of the rest and the Bible teachers are completely divided on this. Everybody recognizes that Psalm 86 is a song of acknowledgments. These are defining statements. But it's as if the psalmist either, one of two things is true about Psalm 86. Either David sat down and he wrote this out the same way he wrote all of the others, but about half of the expositors recognize that it, almost every section of Psalm 86 is a copy of previous songs. Statements that he wrote in other songs are all collected. Now let's put this in a practical sense for us. If everything that you believed and everything that you live could simply be boiled down or reduced to four simple statements, four acknowledgments about who you are, what would those statements be? For some of us, it might be an acknowledgement or statement about our faith, about our work, about our families, our relationship with God. The things that we, and I run into this all the time as a pastor when I'm doing funerals. Somebody lives 70, 80, 90 years, and then they die, and here I am in a 15 or 20 minute eulogy. I've got to define their entire life in just those few moments. It's almost as if the writers, whether it was David or the editors who took what David had already written and said, what are the four defining statements about David's belief in life? How he thought, how he lived, if you reduce them down to four simple statements, what would those be? Someone has said, and I, and I share this many times at funerals, you're never really ready to live until you know how you want to be remembered when you die. That's such an interesting statement to me. You're never really ready to live until you know how you want people to remember you when you're gone. And then you're going to make choices every day that will make that memory be a reality. And it's as if the editors looked at all the songs of David's life and said, what are the songs or statements or acknowledgments that David has written that completely define who he is? how he thought, how he lived. And they put those together in one last song that would be sung by the people as they worshiped in the temple. And those four themes or statements of acknowledgement were this. In verses one through seven, 
David declared over and over and over again in every circumstance of his life, God, I need you. God, I need you. God, I need you. And then in verses 8 through 10, in other songs, David said, God, someday everybody is going to worship you. And these were from those great messianic psalms that David wrote and celebrated the covenant promise in which one of his descendants would be on the throne in Jerusalem. Someday everybody's going to worship you. Then in the third section, David in all of his songs represents this concept of, God, I want to honor you. I want to honor you with everything that I am. I'm going to honor you. And then finally, as you read through in verses 14 through 17, in the last section, he says, everyone needs you. Everyone needs you. Now, this is really kind of interesting because as you're looking at this as it flows, it just seems to kind of jump around haphazardly. I need you. Everyone's going to worship you. I will honor you. Everyone else needs you. And you say, wow, that's kind of a strange flow, isn't it? Except as you study this, you find out that this is more than just a song. See, in Western literature, we tend to think in terms of linear motion. We start at the beginning and we flow through to the end. And the end becomes climactic. And everything up to it builds up to it. But in this poem, this uses a more Eastern style of writing poetry. It's called a chiasm or chiastic in nature. And the word chiastic is simple symbolized by the letter X, and it simply means it is a mere image of itself. That half of the poem is a reflection of the first section. So let me show you what that looks like as we're reading and studying it. This is the shape of a chiastic poem. And the top section and the bottom section are reflective images of each other. So in verses 1 through 4, you have the theme of these verses, God, save your servant. Oh, when you get to verses 16 and 17, it's exactly the same. It's the mirror image. At the top, in verses 5 and 6, it's God is full of unfailing love. Oh, look at that. In verse 15, God is full of unfailing love. And what happens here is instead of thinking from Western perspective of linear direction, we are seeing something that's completely different and foreign to us. The climax of this poem is not at the end where we would expect it to be, but rather the climax is in the center sections of the poem. And then everything that follows the climax isn't anticlimactic, it's simply reflective of the opening section. So as we study this, instead of, let's study this in terms of how we think and how we write. So instead of looking at the way that David wrote this chronologically as it flows, I need you, all will worship you, I will honor you, everyone needs you, let's study this in terms of how Westerners think in linear motion and everything will just change order a little bit. And now we'll look at this this morning by going, section one, I need you. Section two, I will honor you. Then section three is in verses 14 through 17, everyone needs you. It's not just me. Everyone needs you. And then the climax of this song, which is actually in the center of it as it was written, is someday, ultimately, everybody is going to worship you. All right? So having that understanding of where we're going, now let's look at the poem. We read it in verse, in chapter 86, verses 1 and following. Hear me, Lord, and answer me for I'm poor and needy. Guard my life, for I'm faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I'm in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there's none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. 
All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great. And you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassion, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me. Have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame for you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. And the song ends. Again, as we're going through it this morning, we're not going to follow the chronological flow, but we're going to move through and follow the logical flow as, it, as we understand it in a linear motion as Westerners. So we're looking at it this way. I need you. I will honor you. Everyone needs you. And ultimately, everyone will worship you. So we start with the first section. I need you. I need you in verses 1 through 7. David does this in such an interesting way. I've already told you that the form of the poem is unique because it is chiastic. But here's another thing that is unique about this poem. David over and over and over makes these bold statements. In the grammar, they are imperative verbs. They are commands. And each one of them should have an exclamation point. And he makes these commands. It's almost as if he's yelling at God. And after he makes the imperative command, he has a parenthetical section that explains why he's saying this. Hear me! And it's so interesting that the word hear is literally bend down to me. He's saying, God, you're up there in heaven. You're seated in the throne room of heaven. I need you to bend down so that you can hear me down on earth. Jehovah, answer me! These are the commands. They're in the imperative tense. And then he explains why. Hear me, answer me, because I'm poor and needy. Guard my life! for I am faithful to you. Save your servant, because I trust in you. I need you, God. I need you. Now, it's so interesting. Let's step back to the 1600s when William Shakespeare was writing his play, the famous play, Romeo and Juliet. And there is a famous line in that play where Shakespeare asks, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. And Shakespeare is writing and saying the words we use are really irrelevant. Whether I call this a chair really doesn't matter. It still functions as a chair, right? We could call that a microphone or a music stand or a guitar or whatever else we have. And we can switch words around and it really doesn't matter. It just happens to be the word that we assign to a particular object and it has no real difference whether we use that word or any other word. And that might be true if we were talking about chairs or guitars or pianos or something like that. But when you go to the Hebrew Old Testament and you see the names of God, words are not irrelevant. God very deliberately, intentionally chose what words were to be communicated, and the names that God chose to identify himself are important because each of the names of God in the Old Testament reflect his character. This is so important. When David is writing this poem, he uses three very specific names of God. Two of them we've seen over and over and over in almost every poem. But he uses the word Jehovah, Elohim, and Adonai. 
Jehovah is the covenant name of God, and that shows up four times. Elohim is the all-powerful name of God. That shows up seven times. But then David uses the term Adonai, which is the authoritative name that means king or master. And God very intentionally inspired David to use these names because of what they represent. Notice when he cries out from verse 2, God, you are my Elohim. You're the all-powerful God. Nothing is bigger, nothing is greater, nothing is stronger than you. Oh God, my Elohim, I want you to be gracious to me. Be merciful. Now it's not Elohim, but he says, Adonai, be merciful and gracious, my king, my master, because I call on you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Adonai, because I trust, I turn to you. Boy, David is crying out to God in the strongest terms, saying, I need you, I need you, I need you. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Not just when I'm in trouble, but every single day of my life. I need you, God. I need to experience the fullness and the blessedness of your presence and your grace, your mercy in my life. Charles Spurgeon, in response to this, wrote and says, you know, you can no more exhaust the mercy and the grace of God than a minnow could ever drink the entire Atlantic Ocean. Isn't that true? I, you know, can I just be honest with you and say that sometimes I find myself in a situation because by personality, I, you know, tend to be a leader, a fixer, and if there is a problem, I'm going to take care of this. And oh, if I can't fix the problem, then I turn to God. Have you ever done that? We think we can take care of the little stuff and then we'll save the big stuff for God. David is going, no, I need you, God. Not just to solve the big problems I can't resolve, but I need to experience your grace and your mercy every single day. That's what keeps me going. You, Adonai, are forgiving. You're good. You're abounding in love to everyone who calls on you. Hear my prayer, Yahweh, the covenant relational name. Hear, listen to my my cry for mercy. When I'm in distress, I call to you because you answer me. If there was one defining statement about David's life that characterized everything he wrote and how he lived, it was, God, I need you. I need you. Can that be said about your life? If somebody were to say, let me reduce everything you are, everything you believe, everything you've ever said, would one of the four statements that absolutely define who you are, God, I need you. I I need you, not just in the big problems, but I need you for every single problem day, every single hour, every single breath. I need your mercy. I need your grace. God, if I don't have you, I don't have anything. I need you. Why is this so important? That we come to the point that we recognize our need for God every moment in every breath. Because when I'm independent from God, when I think I can take care of myself, I tend to honor and glorify the person who in that moment is the most important to me. And if I think that I can take care of all my problems, if I think that I just need me until there are big issues that I can't handle, then I'll need God. Then my focus is on me. And I tend to glorify myself and my abilities. But when I come to the point of saying, God, it's not about me. I need you. I need you. I don't need anyone but you. I need you. Then, having that understanding, that foundational basis for everything I am and everything I think, then that will lead me to the second great statement that defines me. I don't have to worry about honoring me anymore. Because I need God, I'm going to honor and glorify him. My whole life is going to be focused on honoring you, honoring you, 
honoring you. Teach me your way, Jehovah, that I may rely on you, your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. This term, undivided, is really an interesting word in the Hebrew language and even in our own concept of undivided. It actually best communicates this concept of being unfractured. Unfractured. Now, I asked this question in the first service, and most of us are boomers in the first service and older folks, but in this service, I'll go ahead and try it. How many of you, if you grew up in the 60s, all of us who grew up in the 60s, almost every morning watched the Rocky and Bullwinkle show? How many of you did that? Raise your hand. Look, okay. Now, if you remember watching the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, this is one of my favorite sections when they had the fractured fairy tales. Now, fractured fairy tales was where they would take some normal you know, fairy tale, Rapunzel or Cinderella or something else, and then they would completely twist the story and mess it up, and it was fractured. It wasn't complete. And we can laugh at those crazy old fractured fairy tales, but it's really not so funny when we have fractured lives. And let's be honest, every one of us here are fractured in one way or another. We all have fractured lives. And we all struggle to find completion and wholeness. And the beauty of the gospel is that God both offers us wholeness. He says, I'll take away all that fractured stuff in your life. And he offers us wholeness, but then he says, all right, now I want you to pursue wholeness by being wholly devoted followers of Jesus. One of the greatest truths that David is writing that so completely defines him, he says, God, I need you because my life has been fractured. And as you put my life back together, all I want to do is focus on you. I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. Folks, understand, this is one of the most important spiritual realities any of us could ever get a hold of. Because of sin and the influence of our culture, every one of us have fractured lives. We are fractured because of the influence and the consequences of sin. Some of us have fractured lives in terms of relationships. We grew up in fractured homes, mentally, emotionally, relationally. We are fractured. We are divided. We struggle. It may not be everyone in all the same areas, but there isn't a person here in this room or watching online, there isn't a single person in the world who hasn't experienced the painful consequences of being fractured in one way or another. And God says, I want to just bring wholeness to your life again. I want to take away that fractured side of you. And I'm going to do that. And it starts the moment we get saved. He starts the work through Christ's salvation. And then the Holy Spirit moves in. And the Holy Spirit starts working inside of me to bring wholeness to my life again. But it's the, the crazy part about this, and the thing that is so important for us to understand is, it's not just a one-sided issue. It's a double-sided coin. God does the work of bringing healing, but he says, if you want to experience it, you have to pursue it also. God doesn't bring wholeness. God doesn't take away the divided, fractured side of us if we're not interested in pursuing him. When I say, God, more than anything else, I want my life to honor and glorify you by experiencing the wholeness that you bring. That word whole is such an interesting word. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines wholeness as not lacking any part or member that should belong to something. But I really like the se second aspect of the definition. It is to experience and enjoy health and vigor. It's to be not divided, not fractured, or scattered among several areas of interest. God says, Steve, I want to take all of that crazy fractured side of you away, and I'm going to bring you together and make you whole so that you can be healthy and vigorous in terms of your life, your relationships, and everything that you're going to accomplish. Wow, 
I can't do that on my own. I need God. And when I recognize how much I need God and I submit myself to Him and I pursue Him with wholehearted devotion, God starts healing the fractured part of me. And that's what He wants to do in you. You may be here today and nobody else knows what's going on inside of you. Nobody knows how divided and fractured you feel right now. And on the outside, everything looks good. Oh, hey, every, hey, hey. And inside you go, oh, God. God, so, so divided. I'm so struggling. God says, let me heal that for you. Let me put everything together and make you whole and healthy and vigorous again. And that's why David can say in this section now, as he wants to glorify and honor God, I will praise you, Adonai my Elohim, my King, my God, with all of my heart. No division, no fracturedness. I am going to pursue you. I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to praise you with all of my heart. And I'm going to do this, not just today, but forever. God, this is what's going to define my life. Does that phrase, I will honor you, I will glorify you, with all of my heart, define who you are? It is a life-changing reality. I need you. I'm going to honor you. And then it's as if David just kind of steps back and goes, wait a minute, it's not just me. And the third section is, everyone needs you. The third statement that defines everything that David is and everything that he's written about. God, it's not just me. Everyone, everyone struggles. Everyone needs you. Everyone is lost and spiritually blind. Elohim. And he starts out again, the all-powerful name of God. Elohim. Arrogant, insolent people are attacking me. Ruthless people. These violent gangs are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. This is so much more than just saying they're careless about you. They don't even know you. These people are living out their fractured lives, their sin nature, and they have no understanding of who you are and what you offer us. Oh yes, you could say they don't care, but it's more than the fact that they don't care. They're blind. It's like Jesus when he's hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Oh yes, they do. They're crucifying Jesus. In the bigger picture, they don't get it though. And David is saying exactly the same thing. Father, they don't get it. They don't understand you. They have no regard for you. But you, Adonai, my king, my master, you are compassionate and you are a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The unsaved don't see that. They don't get it, God. And then he pushes even further. Oh, turn to me. Have mercy on me. All of these are imperative commands. He's calling out to God. Turn to me. Have mercy. Give strength. Save me. Just as I serve you like my mother did. Now, this phrase, as my mother did, is really kind of an interesting thing. It is a poetic translation, not a literal translation. Literally, in the Hebrew language, all all it says is, Save the son of your servant. But the servant is in the feminine rather than the masculine form. And so it says, save the son of your female servant. And Bible translators have to figure out what does that mean? That's part of the challenge of translation from one language to another. What does it literally say and what does it mean and how do you communicate that? And so some translations have translated the female servant as his mother. Some say it's Israel itself, the nation of Israel. But regardless of what that feminine servant is, the real point is he's calling out to God. He's saying, God, I need you and they need you. In verse 17, He makes it even more emphatic when he says, give me a sign or show me a sign of goodness. Not because I'm in a mess, 
But, and here is that statement and the restatement, the command and the explanation of the command. God, show me a sign of your goodness. Why? So that my enemies can see it and be put to shame. For you, Yahweh, have helped me and comforted me. He's calling out and saying, not only do I need help, but they need to see you. They need to recognize you. Because right now the unsaved don't know you. They don't recognize you. They don't acknowledge you. They have no regard. But they need it. Think of the people that we work with. Think of the people who live in our neighborhoods. Think of those people that you go to school with every day. They mock you. They make fun of your faith. Why do they do that? Because they don't know God. They don't understand. And they desperately need him. The message is a paraphrase of the translation. It's not a translation itself. But look at how the message paraphrases verse 17. Make a show of how much you love me so the bullies who hate me will stand there slack-jawed as you, God, gently and powerfully put me back on my feet. God, let them see that you are compassionate. Let them see that you're gracious. Let them see that you're merciful so that it'll make a mark in their lives. Now, understand this. God invites us to know him, to experience him, to glorify him, to honor him. He says, I want you to come and do this. But God gives us a choice. He never ropes and ties and drags anyone into heaven. But he says, ultimately, everyone is going to recognize and honor Jesus. Ultimately, the choice that he gives us is whether or not we're going to do it in this life or in the next. Understand that. God gives us a choice. Are we going to respond to his redemptive love, his grace, his mercy, come into relationship through Christ in this life? And if we say no and we shake our fist and say, no, this is my life, I'm going to do what I want, he says, okay. But the consequences are you're separated from me, but one day you will acknowledge. And this is the point that becomes the climax, the the real focus of the whole song. One day, everyone is going to acknowledge and worship God. They are going to honor and glorify him. Look at how David writes this. And it shows up in the middle of the song, but it is the climactic theme. It is the climactic acknowledgement of everything that David is writing. Among the gods, there is no one like you, Adonai. The king name, the master name. There's no pagan God who's like him. No deeds can compare with yours. And here it is, nine. All the nations that you've made one day will come and worship before you, Adonai. There's the king name again. They will honor. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great. You do marvelous deeds. And you alone are Elohim, the all-powerful creative God. Wow. Wow. He says, one day, everyone is going to acknowledge you. Everyone's going to regard you. Everyone's going to bow down and acknowledge you in the most powerful way. And this is exactly what Paul is writing about in Philippians 2, when he says, one day, as Jesus takes the throne, at the name of Jesus, every now, every knee is going to bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what's really interesting in the Greek language, the word Lord here is the same word as Adonai in the Hebrew language. They are going to recognize King Jesus to the glory of God the Father. Think of what it's... Look, 
One of the coolest things that we can do as we're studying the Bible is get past the point of just reading the, pa- the words on paper and seeing, seeing these stories as one-dimensional. Think three-dimensional. These were real people. They had real emotions. They went through the same kind of stuff that we did every day. They lived normal lives. And the expressions of their faith were just as real as anything that you and I. Now, think about David. Here he is, the king of Israel. God is given him this incredible covenant promise that one day one of his descendants is going to sit on his throne forever and ever and ever and ever. Think about David in his older age as he's sitting on his throne one day and he's just meditating on the covenant promise that God has made that one day one of his descendants will sit on that very throne. Man, Can I be honest with you and tell you, I love my grandkids. Man, I love my... My granddaughter was here this weekend. I had so much fun with her. I got about 100 pictures if you want to see on my phone. I love my grandsons down, and I, I, I like my kids, but I love my grandkids. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that in front of you. All right, so... I look at my kids, and my kids are full grown, and they live their lives, and that's so cool. But now I'm looking at my granddaughter as I'm playing with her, and I'm going, I wonder what she's going to be when she grows up. I wonder what she's going to do. I see my grandsons, and they're in grade school and junior high, and I'm going, I wonder what they're going to be when they get older. And I start to pray for them, and I think about them as they're going to be pursuing life. Now, that's how we all think, isn't it? Don't you think that about your grandkids when you're bouncing them on your knee or playing with them on the floor? And think about David. He's sitting on his throne. And he's thinking about his grandson, his great-grandson. Great, 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 great. He doesn't know how many generations it will take before the covenant promise is fulfilled. All he knows is that one of his descendants, one of his grandchildren, no matter how many numbers are behind the word grandchildren, but one of his grandchildren are going to take that throne and they are going to be the greatest king that ever lived, regardless of how famous, how great David's kingdom was. This grandson is not just going to rule over Israel, he is going to rule over the entire world. And it won't be just 10, 20, 30, 40 years like David. It'll be forever and ever and ever. And then picture David. He's just trying to take this all in. And all of a sudden, thinking about that grandchild who is going to be sitting on that throne who will be a greater king than he is. I wonder if he just kind of felt his crown and maybe symbolically even took it off and set it on the throne and said, that's for you. That's for you. The closest thing that we have that would be a picture of that was before Queen Elizabeth died. And Queen Elizabeth, her parents were fully devoted followers of Jesus. And throughout Elizabeth's life, she made many statements about the importance of her Christian faith and what Christ meant to her. And there is an amazing story about one day she was interacting with a chaplain and the chaplain had been talking about one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to be sitting on that throne. And Queen Elizabeth responded to the chaplain by saying, oh, how I wish that the Lord would come in my lifetime. And the chaplain was surprised and said, why? Why, why does your majesty feel this earnest desire for Jesus to come in your lifetime? Her response was, I should so love to lay my crown at his feet. And David is saying, man, this crown is for you. One day, everyone's going to worship you. Zechariah, the prophet, reiterates this. And David says, among the gods, there's no one like you, King Jesus. There's no one who can compare with you. All the nations you've made are going to come and worship you, King Jesus. Zechariah puts the topping on the cake and he says, in that day, over all the earth, 
King Yahweh, King Jesus. In that day, King Yahweh only will be worshipped. That's what defined David. His firm belief in God's redemptive promises, his promises regarding the kingdom. David said, if there are four statements that absolutely define my life, God, I need you. God, I'm going to honor you. God, it's not just me. Everyone needs you. And God, one day, everyone's going to worship you. Can I just be honest and ask, you know, if somebody were to define your life in four statements, would these four statements be what they would say? God, I need you. Not just for the big messes, but I need you for every breath that I take. God, because I need you, I'm going to honor you. You're my focus. God, it's not just me. Everyone needs you. My family needs you. My co-workers need you. My neighbors need you. My classmates need you. God, everyone needs you. And they don't even understand right now how desperately they need you. One day, God, we're all going to recognize and acknowledge and worship you. The coolest thing is we don't have to wait till then. These can define our lives today, right now. Is this who you are? Do these four simple statements that define David's life define yours? Let's pray.